Welcome to the presentation on Prime Subcontractor Relationships Training, sponsored by the South Dakota DOT. A quick disclaimer. Um, this is for information only uh, and just be used as a guideline for understanding prime contractor and subcontractor relationships. It's not to be considered as legal advice. So this is what we're going to be going through today. Hopefully uh, be done in less than an hour. We're going to talk about the definition of relationships, uh, why prime subcontract, the different types of relationship between prime and sub and sub to prime. Uh, we're going to talk about quality of data, uh, equaling the quality of the relationships. Uh, we're going to talk about strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats for both subs and primes, why those are important. We're going to talk about the different types of contractual relationships that a sub and prime might have. We're going to talk briefly on bonding and on liens. And then at the end, we'll have a quick summary. Uh, questions will, uh, since this is a recorded presentation, you will have to submit your questions via email and we can answer them then. Um, at the end of the presentation, there are a few people that you can reach out to, myself being one of them, if you do have questions. So what are relationships? When I think of professional relationships, I typically think of politicians and how they build their constituency. Uh, you know, the, I'm just like you, do you want a picture of me kissing your baby? Shake my hand, see, just like you. Um, politicians, they try to be relatable, they try to appear to be a good listener. Usually they're nice and friendly. Uh, you might walk away from them saying, well, that politician, he was a real straight shooter, or that politician really tells it like it is. Uh, but politicians, they don't make contracts. They make promises. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're kind of just like the good old days when the handshake actually meant something. But now, positive relationships are still built on handshakes and the old grip and grin. Um, but they're also built on top of meeting or exceeding your requir the requirements of your contract. And contracts, subcontracts, and even sub-subcontracts are the new handshake. So why do we subcontract? And this is coming from the prime's perspective. So contractors, particularly prime contractors, typically can't do all the work by themselves. In many cases, it's not even legal for them to, to work, to do all the work all by themselves. Um, and this is where subcontracts come in handy. Uh, subcontract can fill the gaps where a contractor doesn't have uh, a particular specialty. Um, think of as an example, when a paving firm needs an electrician to install the roadway lighting, uh, they're going to subcontract out the electrician and the electrician will do the work because well, there's a, quite a few different reasons. You have to be a licensed electrician to do that sort of work, being one. Uh, secondly, most roadway contractors aren't electricians, but you, you get what I'm saying here. Uh, subcontractors can also fill a mis missing labor component. Uh, a, a paving contractor, for example, might need additional hands to get a certain amount of roadway done in a certain period of time, and they might be interested in subcontracting that work out. Also, uh, typically with uh, specialty work and specialty contractors, uh, a specialty subcontractor can do the work better, as in provide higher quality. Uh, they can do it faster. It takes less time for them to be on the job than it would be for somebody else to do it. And they can probably do it for less money because they're already trained up, they're already geared up, they already have the equipment, etc. So also in this slide, we have this outcome pyramid. Um, you see the three points of the pyramid being budget, time, and quality. Uh, you know, to get the best possible outcome, a subcontractor might be able to meet the budget, uh, produce a, a high quality product, and be able to do it on time. 
And that's what you're actually looking for as a prime contractor. But uh, really primes, especially for DOT work, uh, need other contractors to subcontract with because it's specialty cost and time. Uh, they need subcontractors to be able to make, make a particular timeline at a certain price point uh, in order to make the prime's bids for the work more competitive. If the prime is trying to self-perform all the work and it's going to take more time, most likely it'll cost more money. It's just more cost effective for them to subcontract it out. Uh, also, subcontracting helps primes meet specific set-aside requirements, uh, requirements uh, which also, the more the set-aside that they have uh, for DOT requirements, the more competitive it's going to make them. And risk reduction. If a prime subcontracts, the subcontractor takes on some of the risk that the prime would be taking on. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later. Why do subs need primes? So for us, if a sub is working for a prime, typically that subcontractor is going to be able to work on larger contracts, uh, more complex contracts, uh, bigger projects. Subcontractors can get more, proje more projects of varying type thereby increasing the size and diversity of their portfolios. Um, more projects means more work and more growth. So cash flow, uh, more cash flow, uh, more employees, making you more productive, making you able to work on more projects at one time. Uh, just really helps grow your firm and it also helps the prime meet their DB subcontractors uh, to fulfill the, the set aside requirements. Let's talk about quality of data equaling the quality of relationships. The very first thing that we're going to talk about is communication. Communication is key. It's the key to building quality relationships and it goes both ways for primes and for subs. Primes need to be seeking out other smaller contractors to help them. Smaller contractors need to be reaching out to larger contractors so that those larger contractors are aware of their presence and what they're able to provide for services. Uh, it's important as a subcontractor to make yourself available to have conversations with potential larger contractors who could potentially be clients. Uh, it's kind of a funny story, but I used to work with this guy who used to keep a very detailed log of every phone conversation that he had with other contractors that he worked with or contractors that he wanted to work with. He actually digitized this log and uh, even managed to automate it so it would remind him to touch base with contractors that he hadn't talked to in a while. I don't know what his particular set points were on that, but uh, anyway, he called them quote unquote touches every time he talked to someone. I always thought that was the weirdest thing to call uh, contacting somebody. And it was, it sounded kind of creepy, but it really worked out well for him. And he eventually uh, worked his way right up the firm. And I think he is a, a VP and partner of a, one of the particular branches of that firm now. But he would, uh, you know, call to check on official business. Uh, checking out a project or whatever, but also he would just call the chit chat and catch up. Uh, it was part of his process to developing leads and uh, learning about new projects before they might've hit the street. But uh, he was a very capable senior PM uh, and his communication was spot on. And the fact that he talked to the people that he needed to talk to on a regular basis really made him a key player in a lot of projects. But you know, communication isn't just about talking about on the phone, it's also about the written word. 
uh, whenever we're writing letters or emails or even text messages, we uh, need to make sure that we're using professional language. We're trying to keep our grammar and spelling 100% all the time. Uh, make sure you proofread all your proofread all your emails before sending them, uh, especially when you're working on fostering a positive relationship with a potential client. Uh, I personally am a big fan of peer reviews with critical evaluations of my written word. You know, having good feedback, both positive and negative, will help you grow as a writer. And uh, I definitely encourage those. Also, a little pro tip here, try to keep your email exchanges as brief as possible. It's directly to the point. Nobody wants to sit there and read a, a short novel. Typically, anything that I know is going to be more than a couple of paragraphs, I will draft into an official letter, put it on letterhead, signature block, the whole jazz, and then send it as an attachment to email. Uh, here's a few other tips. Uh, the biggest complaint that I hear from prime contractors regarding their subcontractors is that the sub can't supply the proper documentation uh, in a timely manner. Uh, it can be a, there's a whole bunch of different things that I've heard issues with uh, submittals, schedule info, and uh, the big one, certified payroll. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that it's the subcontractor's job to feed the prime with accurate and complete and timely information. There's nothing more frustrating from the prime and owner side of uh, than submittals that continually get rejected for revision and or resubmittal due to incomplete data or improper product selection or other details that indicate that the contractor hasn't looked at the requirements either division one or the specific division that they're submitting on. Make sure you read the specifications that you're responsible for. Understand wh what the owner is looking for. Uh, alternates and equals are usually an option if the proper steps are taken to ask. Uh, there's Sometimes there's a form that needs to be submitted uh, as long as it is an alternate equal. Usually it'll go through. Um, another thing to keep in mind, the submittals typically lead to shop drawings, shop drawings lead to fabrication, fabrication leads to lead time. Lead time could impact the project's critical path. Uh, you need to make sure that you're taking these factors into consideration uh, as a subcontractor. Uh, subcontractors are depending on subs uh, to be where they say that they're, they're going to be when they say they're going to be there, uh, doing what they said they're going to be doing. Uh, I kind of look at this as a, similar to an employee-employer relationship. So primes can't get the job done if the subs aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing, uh, when they're supposed to be doing, and where they're supposed to be doing. Uh, just like if you're, especially if you're a small shop, if you have somebody that calls in sick, that can really impact your productivity for the day. Understand the scope, provide it. Uh, Provide appropriate pricing and execute. Um, so make sure when you're putting your bid together, you know exactly and specifically what is being asked of you. Uh, on not only just the scope of work, you know, as far as so I'm doing curb and gutter for the next 350 feet or whatever, but what's the concrete mix? Is there any sort of uh, specific detail to, regarding the curb and gutter. Uh, does it need additional reinforcement for some reason? Are there any ADA ramps? Uh, are there any accessories that go with the ADA ramps that need to be included in your bid? Just make sure that you fully understand the scope of what you're being asked to do, uh, especially when you're putting your bid together. When you're reviewing your scope of work, um, make sure to note any potential issues that may expose you or could potentially expose the prime or the owner 
to risk and then based on that risk make sure you address, adjust your bid based on that risk the material that's required labor required equipment costs make sure everything's appropriate after your bid has been approved and your contract has been awarded make sure you move forward with your plan uh, transfer transparency and collaboration those these two are kind of go hand in hand uh, make sure you work with your prime not against them uh, doing everything that you can to meet your contractual obligations and your primes needs if for some reason you can't make it to the site when you said you would be there uh, make sure that they know that you're not going to be able to make it uh, don't make your prime track you down to try to figure out what's going on um, just try to keep your prime in the loop uh, let them know when material isn't going to arrive on time or when material costs have changed drastically and uh, your contract cost doesn't cover the expense primes still need you to do the work and they might be willing to work with you uh, primes can help as a conduit to the owner for change orders and claims uh, especially on you know with the market being as volatile as it is right now uh, but if you have identified an issue in the field and an RFI for example is required get it written up and submitted make sure your RFIs are complete and adequately describe the issue if you have any recommendations or solutions to propose include them in the RFI uh, make sure when you're drafting all this up to keep it professional as well get the work done in a timely fashion uh, do everything you can to maintain your trade performance ratio at a one uh, trade performance ratio uh, which we will be discussing in the schedule uh, discussion that we're going to have as well is the amount of time that you say it's going to take versus the amount of time it actually takes so typically we divide the amount of time that it actually took by the time you said it was going to take if it took longer you have a higher than one uh, TPR trade performance ratio if it's lower you're getting it done faster than you said you would uh, you got to keep in mind that your prime contractor is basing their schedule off of how fast subcontractors say they can do the work uh, so make sure you're fulfilling your obligations on your performance and productivity on those uh, lastly help your pro uh, your prime to get paid uh, the big one there complete and submit your certified payroll completely and on time uh, your prime won't get paid until they can supply the appropriate documentation they have to supply and that's certified payroll there's a whole bunch of other paperwork that they also have to supply but uh, certified payroll is a huge hang-up and it's that's a document that comes from the subs gets compiled into a big list and then submitted so you got to make sure that you get that certified payroll done uh, you know a prime that's getting paid is typically a happy prime so make sure you're getting that certified payroll in. also you got to make sure that you provide accurate schedule update information the schedule update is typically part of the prime contractors pay request uh, so if the prime asks you to submit schedule update information make sure you have accurate start finish dates for your activities uh, and pretty you got to be pretty good with your percent completes of course that all get kind of hashed out with uh, the prime and the owner in the long run but you want to be as close to correct as you can be on those and if you have any other sort of reporting requirements daily reports or you know subcontractor daily reports make sure you get all those submitted so that they can be rolled into the primes and then submitted for pay subs subcontractors really should already know their strengths weaknesses opportunities and threats so strengths what is that subcontractor to uh, what, what what can they do that others can't what are they the best at what are their weaknesses uh, what can't they do that others can do better uh, what sort of opportunities who needs their that subcontractors particular services 
when uh, is there money to be made there in threats? Who's the competition uh, what, and what risks are involved with doing work? So as a subcontractor, you should already know what these are for your particular situation, for your particular particular firm. Uh, Prime is going to want to know if you're a good fit for their particular project that they're going after. The Prime is going to want to be confident in the selection of their subcontractors that they'll be working with and need to use. And in order for them to have that confidence, they'll need to know the subcontractor's strengths and weaknesses. This is where the transparency as discussed in the previous slide comes to play. Um, the Prime should know what the sub's capabilities and strengths are. Uh, what are what is that prime or what's that subcontractor's crew size? What is their normal production rate? What are their costs per unit? Um, they'll want to know your weaknesses. Um, how does the sub deal with absorbing market volatility? Just like we were talking about before. Uh, what is the labor pool that the sub is pulling from? Is it a union shop? Is it non-union? If it's union shop, do they have folks on the bench that can get to the job site? Uh, what's the experience level of the sub? Uh, have they done this type of work before? Are they capable of getting the work done? Are they going to be available? Has the sub overcommitted to other projects, etc.? There's a whole laundry list of items that a prime is going to evaluate a subcontractor on before selection. But primes will want to understand all these strengths and weaknesses before seeing a deal with the sub. Uh, it's in the sub's best interest for the prime to know uh, all these uh, as well. Uh, the sub doesn't want to commit to a contract that they may not be able to complete or achieve the desired result on. That only damages the sub's reputation and potentially lead to claims or litigation. And of course, that ends up being less work and more out of pocket expense. So essentially, it's counterproductive for both primes and subs to not know and understand the capabilities and expectations. Uh, this also goes for the subs to the primes. So subs should have a good understanding of the risks associated with working with a particular prime. Uh, same situation as before as far as strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. But, uh, you know, as a subcontractor, the things that you're going to really be keyed in on are, does the prime have a good reputation with their other subs? Are subs being paid on time? Are subs being sued by the prime? Or is litigation, you know, sometimes the litigation is justified uh, with some primes. It also goes the other direction. Does the prime fight for the subs? Is the prime going to be moving information from sub to client or owner or DOT if there's an issue? Is the prime also willing to pay fair price for work? Uh, sometimes subcontractors are willing to take a price cut uh, just for opportunity cost. Uh, but you have to evaluate if does working with this prime open up other opportunities in the future uh, and should that be reflected in your price and then also does working with this prime make sense does it move the sub towards or away from overall goals all very important things to consider before contracting uh, a lot of times subs get into contracts with primes that they most likely should have just passed on. Uh, you know, I've heard it said before that sometimes a subcontractor's best decision is to pass up on work. That's something to just keep in mind. So we're going to talk briefly about the different types of subcontractor relationships. Uh, the primary contractual relationship that we see are direct subcontracts. There's essentially there's a prime contract holder who then individually contracts with subs. Uh, but there's also teaming, joint venturing, mentor protege agreements. Uh, or they're all very popular relationships that we see. Uh, all of these relationships require the same fundamental uh, fundamentals as described in the previous slides. 
So let's talk traditional subcontracting agreement. In a traditional prime subcontract agreement, the prime is the contract holder with the quote unquote owner and the subcontractor works directly with the prime or for the prime. This gets back to that uh, employee employee situation. The prime being the employer is the boss and is providing a service to the client or the owner with work being performed by the employees or the subcontracts. I, I, it just seems like a very simple and straightforward way to explain that. Uh, but the prime has full control of the contract with the owner and is ultimately the responsible party since the contract is between the owner and the prime, not the owner and the subcontractors. Uh, this doesn't absolve subcontractors of liability since the subcontracts, uh, subcontractors have contracts with the prime and there's a li liable component there. Uh, but typically we see communication for the subcontractor typically goes straight to the prime and then the prime communicates that to the owner or uh, the owner's team, whether it's a design team or a construction management team. But this gets back to why uh, quality communication is very important between subs and primes and therefore primes and owners. Uh, remember the game, uh, I, I don't know if you played it when you were a kid, but we played it when I was a kid, it, we, we called it operator. I've heard it called telephone as well. Uh, but there's a, a line of uh, you know, children is what we were, so we'll call us children. Uh, and the the child at the very front of the line whispers to the child next to them in line a phrase. It could be a phrase about whatever, it doesn't matter, anything. And then that phrase would get passed from child to child until it gets to the end of the line. And then the child at the end of the line says what the phrase was. And usually the phrase was totally different from what it started out with. So that's why as a subcontractor, if you need to communicate something to the owner, we need to make sure that our language is very clear, very concise. Uh, the information and data and descriptions and issues are being communicated by the sub through the prime to the owner uh, as clearly as possible because there could be mixed messages and route if we're not careful. Uh, we also, uh, <clears throat> frequently, the, the prime is just passing the information up the chain because they don't clearly understand what the issue is because they hired a specialty contractor to do the work that the specialty contractor understands the, the, the minutia of that particular scope of work that the prime doesn't have any specialty in. Uh, so that's another reason why as a subcontractor, we need to make sure that we're very clear with what we're trying to say. Um, but typically primes don't want subs talking directly to the owners. Uh, subs need to just understand uh, how liability and claims to the owner or from the owner work. If the subcontractor uh, causes a project not to complete on time, the subcontractor might be held for liable for the liquidated damages. Uh, the prime as a contract holder will most likely pass through claims to subs if the sub is responsible. There are some variabilities uh, that may cause this to not be true. Uh, like it could just be cost prohibitive. Uh, it's not in the best interest of the prime. As an example, if you are a very special specialty contractor and this prime has to work with you on other projects, either because of own requirements like a DBE or uh, percentage or uh, the service that's being provided is just so special uh, that you can't get anywhere else. And I think of like of elevator firms when it comes to that sort of thing. Um, the prime might not go after a sub, but it's important to note that primes can go after subs with claims. Uh, subs need to understand when and how they will get paid. Uh, all that language should be inside the contracts. Uh, is the is the payment based on time material? Is it like a 50%, 40%, 10%? So you get 50% right up front, 40% at completion with 
held as retainage until uh, projects complete and punch list funding is released. Uh, is it based off schedule values? And we're going to talk about that a little bit in the scheduling discussion. Uh, but schedule values is really the way to go. Uh, this all can tie back to understanding the strengths and weaknesses of the prime too. Is the prime going to be financial, uh, financially solvent enough to pay subs if the prime has not been paid by the owner? Uh, just as an example, you're a subcontractor working for a prime and you've submitted all your documentation. You've submitted your certified payroll. Uh, you've submitted all your reports, all your schedule updates to the prime and there's no reason for the prime not to pay you but the prime has been paid for the work because of another subcontractor that hasn't submitted all their paperwork is the prime still going to be able to pay you on time knowing that they're going to get paid by the owner or client um, relatively quickly uh, but that's something just to keep in consideration when you're thinking of working with a particular prime um, it's also, you know, primes can refuse or withhold payments to subs uh, for not fulfilling their requirements. So uh, if a sub hasn't met contractual requirements, like they haven't completed the scope of work, uh, their certified payroll hasn't been turned in, uh, retain, their retainage for punch list items, and things of that nature, you kind of need to make sure you know and understand exactly when you're going to get paid, how you're going to get paid. Uh, when you've done the work. So there's three other big uh, prime to sub relationships that we're going to talk about briefly. Uh, so uh, teaming agreements, so contractor teaming agreement arrangements, I'm sorry, CTAs. Uh, teaming agreements are just a type of relationship that can be found uh, found between prime and sub. Uh, teaming is usually done to secure contracts with partners, uh, the partners being the contractors, uh, to help a team as a whole win a particular contract and then to perform the work. The owner contracts with the team. It doesn't co contract with a single entity of the team. It contracts with everybody that's associated with the team. Uh, you have to be real careful when you're going into teaming agreements, uh, especially if you're a small business and if you team with a, a, a particular partner that could make your head count so big that you're no longer a small business. Um, because as a team, you can be considered affiliated with and uh, that is just something that you need to be aware of and kind of pay attention to before going into teaming agreements. Uh, teaming agreements, if you're a sub and or typically a sub and you're going to be working with a prime, you need to make sure you understand who is in control of what and when, uh, who is doing what parts, you know, of the particular contract that you're going after, who makes decisions as far as the direction that the project is going, how are you going to get from start to end, who is it going to be the person that, or group that makes those calls, and uh, percentage of work. You want to make sure that there's an equitable balance there with the percentage of work. Does the percentage of work that the subcontractor doing equal percentage of pay? Uh, does the arrangement make sense? So before going into a teaming agreement, you just kind of want to understand that. Uh, and then also you need to understand the risk and liability. Uh, with teaming uh, agreements, risk and liability are shared amongst the team. And joint ventures or joint venturing, it's a contractual, a JV is a contractual entity between two or more parties. Uh, what it does is it just expands the experience base of the contracting joint venture, provides access potentially to new markets, uh, allows you to combine assets. Uh, 
uh, and helps with uh, shared risk and liability. You can not just combine assets, but combine skills and capabilities. It's important to note that JVs, if you're in a JV, you are considered affiliated. So as we stated for the team agreement, be careful there. Um, Mentor Protege is a small uh, SBA program. And really the key to the Mentor Protege program is to uh, motivate larger businesses to mentor small businesses uh, so that they can compete and specifically specifically to compete in mentor protege contracts. So if you go into a mentor protege agreement as a sub to a, say, a, or I shouldn't say a sub, but a smaller firm as a protege to a mentor, which would typically be a larger firm. It's just an agreement between those two. Uh, you know, the, the mentor can only take on, I think two proteges at a time it's not an exclusive arrangement, but with the mentor protege agreement, it gives those two firms the opportunity to go after these mentor protege contracts uh, as a joint venture. But they're joint ventures that are mentor protege specific. Uh, it's also um, kind of interesting and rare, but a small business can be a mentor to another small business as a protege. Just something to keep in mind. Real quickly, let's talk about uh, how primes procure subcontracts or the type of uh, procurement methods that they use. And we're going to talk about low bidding, lowest responsible bid, and best value. What's the difference between the three? So low bid, it's pretty straightforward. It's essentially the lowest price. Who has the lowest price? Uh, for a particular scope of work. This might be a unit cost that the prime is asking for. Uh, it's just like it says, the sub that provides the lowest unit cost that wins the contract. Lowest responsible bid is a little bit more complicated. The, the prime is gonna select the lowest bid that is fully responds to the scope of work provided for the bid. Uh, so make sure you understand the full, the full scope of the work and services and bid accordingly. Uh, this type of bid may involve more complex scopes of work uh, where a single subcontractor is bidding on multiple divisions. There might be some need for a subcontractor to sub out some of the work, so a sub, sub situation. For best value contracts, uh, the prime is going to be, is going to select a sub based on historical performance, quality of outcomes, and lowest bid understanding the what the scoring rubric that's going to be used is going to uh, be used to evaluate evaluate your bid or proposal uh, make sure you know what that's going to be and this is also where having history with the prime is useful performance and payment bonding uh, it was the miller act of 1935 uh, that set the law in place that requires bonding on federal construction projects. Every prime contractor that is bidding on a federal project must post a performance and payment bond covering all labor and material. Uh, performance bonds protect the owner from contract abandonment or other non-performance that may cause critical delays and or expense in the government procurement process. Uh, the bond will defray the owner's cost of substitute performance in the event of a default. So essentially, if a prime contractor goes under or for some reason can't finish a project, the performance bond will cover the expense of completing the project. So the government has what's called sovereign immunity. It essentially means that contractors can't sue the government unless it has consented to the suit. Uh, since contractors can't sue the government, payment bonds ensure that material and labor costs will be covered by the surety in case of non-payment uh, by the owner or by a prime. Uh, the, this reduces the risk taken on by the contractor since the threat of liens can be, can't be used uh, on the government property. So bonding 
is used to weed out irresponsible contractors. Uh, contractors that have performed poorly won't be able to obtain bonding. Uh, contractors that aren't uh, able to pay for the bond or don't have a, a, an appropriate credit history or bonding history won't be able to get a bond for the amount that's required. So this uh, helps kind of weed out the smaller contractors uh, that are, prevents them, you know, contractors that are essentially inexperienced with that sort of project from getting bonding. Uh, performance bonds protect the project owner, ensure, ensuring project completion. We talked about that. Payment bonds protect the subcontractors, laborers, materials suppliers, ensuring that everyone gets paid if the contractor the contract holder does not pay them. Payment bonds help prevent liens against real property. That's correct. Uh, performance of pay, payment bonds are usually issued together as like a, a, a package deal. And you can typically expect to pay between 1-2% of uh, the overall contract value. And that has a little bit of variance uh, depending on credit history, and background checks, and just history with the uh, surety in the past. We're going to talk about liens real quick. Uh, what We're going to talk about what a lien is, what's the difference between a lien and a mechanics lien. Uh, there isn't really much of a difference. Uh, lien waivers and lien releases. So what is a lien? Uh, so a lien essentially interferes with the owner's right to convey clear title on real property. Uh, it could be used by a contractor. If the contractor hasn't been paid, they can put a lien on, on the real property. Um, and it can essentially just be used uh, as a tool to settle debt if owed uh, if a debt is owed by the property owner. Uh, owners uh, or should be keeping track of what has been paid and who has been paid to avoid liens. Mechanics lien, it's a lien. Uh, it's funny because we, we call it mechanics lien, but it's all co contractors can use it. Um, and it's just a contractor's lien on real property. It's just a way for contractors to seek payment for work that's been completed. A lien waiver, it's essentially a receipt. Uh, a lien waiver is a written agreement between a payer and a counterparty where said counterparty gives up their right to place a lien on the payer's property or goods. Um, they're used all the time in the construction industry through all phases of projects. Uh, but it's just uh, it's just like a receipt and can prevent a mechanics lead from being filled or filed. Uh, contains it typically just contains basic project information, a disclaimer. Uh, it usually discusses the amount paid at the time and the amount that's been paid to date. Lean releases. Uh, key on lien releases: do not release a lien until full payment has been received. Uh, when a debt has been paid in full, just you go about releasing the lien. North Dakota doesn't have a specific lien release requirement, but you want to make sure that you, if you've been paid in full, release the lien to avoid additional litigation, which would just end up costing you money anyway. Okay, in summary, Prime contractors need subcontractors. They need them to, in order to be able to get the work done and to meet the requirements of the owners. Subcontractors need prime contractors to get more work, to get bigger projects, to diversify their portfolio, be more competitive in the marketplace. Uh, primes and subs on both sides need to know and understand obligations and fulfill them in order to build these positive relationships so that you can work together in the future and do bigger and better and greater things. So with that, um, we will take any questions that you might. If you have any questions, please contact DBE at projectsolutionsinc.com, call 605-737-0377, or email one of the people listed. Thank you.